there's there has been a haze in Kansas City this last week, and they're blaming it on wildfires, right? Well, wildfires would fit the narrative because then it's climate change. So because yeah. of climate change, there's been wildfires which are producing smoke, which is causing a haze in Kansas City. Hmm. So I have never seen anything like this before. And when my and we are now sick because of it, especially my kids and my wife, who are all now technically immune compromised because my kids are young and my wife is pregnant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like everybody has this like decreased immunity and they are getting this the the aches my wife and the baby have had a fever and like just sniffles and just like it's that same like weird chemical feeling it's just like okay whatever it is whatever it is it's like it's new and i it doesn't feel natural Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father, what is your favorite meal that your wife makes? Like, what's something that she does really, really well at? And if you need a minute, I can go first. Is my wife absolutely crushes pot roast. Like, she just, every time she makes a pot roast, I like savor every minute of it i think it's great she makes it like so it's falling apart like i scoop it out of the pan and it's like falling apart on my plate potatoes carrots gravy everything's always done it's like that's my that's my birthday if my birthday doesn't fall in lent that's my birthday dinner that i ask for it's like by far the best thing that she makes a lot of really good food but her pot roast is next level yeah i am the cook in my house so it's uh i i actually don't know i can't think of the the last time my wife cooked dinner actually i'm the one cooking usually (laughs) 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 but uh which i enjoy which i really really like but but what she did make for years on a regular basis that i absolutely loved is uh, because she's a huge uh what i take that back there's two things that she makes so one, she makes awesome salads. Now, I know that this would sound like crazy where somebody would be like, what, salads? No, no, no. She's like, she's very good. They're very elaborate, like, you know, 10 to 12 different types of ingredients. And the thing that I love about her salads is she always, like, she's always looking for a good salad, eats salad with no dressing. Mm. And I was somebody who was like, I don't That's know if I can... Did. I don't know if I could get with this no dressing thing. That's the way she's to like, do it. She's like, look, let me just make it correctly. Yeah. So she'll put all kind of herbs in there, dill and all kind of different things. And like that, the, the melange of the flavors and then wow, perfect. No dressing needed and fully flavorful. But the thing that I like the most that she makes is she makes like a, um, uh, a baked chicken and mushrooms dish. I don't know what the name of this dish is. But it's absolutely incredible. Like it's just knock your socks off. So those are the two things for sure, sure. that she makes that I like. Yeah. You know, and that's the whole thing is like I tell people you've never had a salad before. I tell people that. Yeah, all the time. it's true. It's true. You've never had a salad before. People haven't. Yeah. Oh boy, you, I don't know. I mean, the potty is a great cook. Yeah, yeah, she's she's a she's a good cook. Um, but I, I just, it's kind of weird because the thing that just I can't shake is like the taco salad, you know, mm. but I don't think she'll mind, but it's like she, she's, she took my mom's recipe. So it's like the fact that she's able to do it just like mom did, that almost yeah. makes it better. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's I good. Think, I think, um. We might have talked about this before. 
Um, but uh, there's like a famous pastry thing or something like in Australia. And um, Father Cosmos has talked about that the people who make this pastry, I don't know what it's called or anything like that. But one of the requirements when they're making it is they have to smile. Like they have to smile while oh, they're really? making it because the, the like, I don't want to sound all new agey, but like the energy goes into the food. Like, like, um, oh, well, but that's true. I mean, I don't think that there's any oh, 100%. question about, no, I mean, there's, there's stories of like monks making bread for kings and the kings are like, how did you make this? Like, this is the best mm-hmm. food I've ever had. Like I have the best chefs in the entire land working for me, but this simple mm-hmm. little monk made the best food I've ever, and he's like, well, I did it with prayer and like love. Mm-hmm. And like, that was my wife was not raised in the house where she was taught cooking like at all. Like, Mm -hmm. so my wife had to learn. So I've been here throughout the whole process and she realized probably within the last like three or four years, like the key is love. It's like when the recipe Mm -hmm. calls for like a half a cup of whatever, or like a half a tablespoon of salt, she puts like a little extra pinch in there as well. Like it's like love, you know, like it's like putting a little bit extra in everything it it seems to translate very very well into like it just makes better food like it has to be and you know we could go on and on about food christ i mean i i I will say that i have really enjoyed since being here and taking up like fishing on a regular basis i have re because like i say i do i cook all the time um for 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 my family and i think to it to it of course there's there's always love in it um, but I will admit, you know, sometimes I'm a little rushed or I'm thinking about other things or whatever. And it's just like it's food. Get dinner on the table. You know what I mean? Sure. But going out and fishing and just, you know, as I'm bringing fish in and looking at, at fish and it's like me anticipating all oh, my kids are going to love this. My wife is going to love this coming home, <laughs> you know cleaning the fish, doing all the things that are necessary in that regard, and then making it for them. And it's just like the reaction, how much they enjoy the flavor of this, of the fish that I'm cooking for them. So, so outweighs anything else that I do, even though it's just like, it'll be just be so simple, like either like just grilled or, you know, just sauteed or baked or whatever it is. But their, their response to it is just like, like it's something out of this world and i know it's well one it's super fresh like obviously it's probably the freshest thing they could eat but i mean i think that there's really and truly something there to the the attention and the effort that's that's put into something changing the taste there's no no doubt about it it translates like that Mm -hmm. that that i'll say energy I don't know if that's the right word, but that, that feeling, that emotion goes into the food without a doubt. And, um, like my son is a super, super picky eater right now. And we can move on from food after this. Like we don't have to sit around and keep talking about food, but my son, Nikolai is a huge, like very picky eater right now. But when he, when he, when we can find food that he likes and Mm. that he is willing to eat, like, I don't know. There's just something that's like something carnal inside of me, like seeing my children eat. I'm just like, yeah, like, yes, I need Mm -hmm. that. Like that's and when they enjoy it too, like when they pack away a huge bunch of food, like, okay, I feel so much better because you know, the normal development, it's okay. But like certain times, like they eat like one fish stick or one cheese stick and then run off. And like, that's good for them. Like, that's okay. Like they don't need much Mm -hmm. more than that. But when they're just packing away food, I am loving it. So I've been there anyway. Um, we don't have a topic for tonight. We didn't really think about it. Um, unless you guys do, cause I had a no. question for Go father ahead. and it could spiral into something else, although it doesn't Let's have see. to, but I had a question that's actually been weighing on me a couple of weeks. Um, in a broad sense, father, like, um, with lots of room for, um, intricacy and like nuance what is a way you can what are some like maybe some guideposts you're looking that you would look for if you had taken communion improperly not unworthily because we are unworthy always but improperly in like a way of like 
ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Like, I should have abstained today. Oh, Just under, well, that. maybe we could start with under what condition should you abstain? That's a good one. There you maybe go. Maybe that's a good place to start. And then after that, maybe like, how do we, how do we know maybe after or whatever? With that's lots a good question, of actually. room, I'm just going to say it right now, lots of room for nuance, lots of room for, yeah. I know he's not frozen. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit just because I just, uh, you know. I want to. I want to be very. Um, I want to tread lightly here, right? Um, you know, uh, the president Saint John Chrysostom. You know, I want to speak of that mystery of nine enemies. You know, so um, I would say that what could really um, set someone up for that, starting there, would be. Um, improper preparation and improper preparation I would put more in a category of were you there or not because I know that there's people who they will go through pretty extensive preparation you know doing canon preparation the longer form of it you know canon's the mother god canon's the uh Christ, guardian angel, um, but they're not there, you know, they're just kind of like rattling off the prayers. And so I think that's one way of, of, you know, kind of being set up for a problem. I think more often than not, there's just a reality that people just aren't taught to prepare for communion. Um, people aren't taught, and depending on what tradition you're coming from, you know, what, what jurisdiction you're in. People aren't really taught um, how to prepare. So that's, you know, kind of like a big a big problem because, um, you know, I'm of the mindset of frequent but not casual communion, you know. And I think the problem always lies into where it becomes, like, casual um, and people don't approach it with the fear that they should have. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, uh, I think that um, unfortunately for a lot of people, they don't have the context by which there may be even a, like alive enough to have their, you know, their kind of uh, senses tell them something's wrong, if that makes sense, mm. you know. Um, and interestingly enough, if you start having phenomena, um, that is communicating to you that you're taking communion improperly, that's a blessing, actually. It's a huge blessing because a lot of people are so, um, dead, um, they're not even aware of anything. And so when someone starts encountering, problems and they're aware like i don't think i'm doing this right that's a good thing that's a really good thing actually and that's a mercy from god it's a chastisement and it's there to help you correct yourself to approach him um with the right and proper heart and attitude you know i think i think something to understand about communion holy communion is that you know it's not a it's not a reward for your your moral behavior you know, and I think that's another thing that people see it as. It's like a reward for being good. Um, and it's not, you know, it's it's the medicine of immortality. And so because of that, there's things that happen that um, people just aren't aware of, both before, you know, liturgy and communion and after that have everything to do with not necessarily like spiritual warfare in regards of the demons, but your passions being inflamed um, because, you know, they're encountering the divine light. So yeah, there's just, there's a lot there. I, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into it. Cause again, like we're, you know, let's just think um, 
I don't want to get inappropriate, you know. I don't know if this is exactly the form because this is kind of getting into that realm, you know. But I think it, I think this is helpful for people to know because um, if you understand that, you know, kind of there a lot that we talk about here, the context should be ultimately how you're approaching um, Holy Communion. You know, so like your repentance, your prayers, your asceticism, all these things, you know, the, the byproduct is, is, you know, the low hanging fruit of the uh, byproduct of that work of prayer, of asceticism, repentance is having a better moral life. But that's just like the kind of byproduct, you know, the end of it is that you are um, in synergy and participation with, with Christ in your salvation. And that you know you're you're entering and, and maintaining um, that awareness of your purification, and then God willing your illumination, God willing your theosis, and that you know talking with your spiritual father is not there so that you could become a better Jedi. It's there so that you can you know be united to Christ. You know, um, getting a prayer rule isn't there so that you can you know flax and say this or that it's it's so that you can actually you know unite with god you know um, fasting isn't there for like a uh, spiritual weight loss program it's there to um, remove the things that keep you dead remove the things that keep you from experiencing the grace of god through the sacraments uh, including god's chastisement you know um that's one of those things where there's these old kind of like uh apocryphal stories of you know old women crying because god hasn't they haven't had any suffering and they've said well mm-hmm. why is god abandoning me why has god abandoned me i haven't suffered for you know three years and we kind of like roll our eyes and chuckle at it and we go like oh yeah but like i you get to a point where you you actually maybe don't say that but you do get to a point where you 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 you, you experience the value out of temptations and that's another huge connection to participation in the sacraments, you know, is, is being aware of God's good hand in everything. They, they illumine us to do that, to become aware of, you know, all things. And so it's like Supreme was saying earlier when we were talking about, you know, being sick, it's like you really can say glory to God for all things once you get into this place where it's like, man, this is all real and... I am at, I am definitely having my eyes open to some things and that becomes exciting to you. And that's where you begin to really, <clears throat> excuse me, start living this, you know, kind of like sacramental life. And pretty much everything begins to be an aid for you to enter into deeper sacramental life. You know, there's no, that dichotomy of this is mundane begins to just fade away. And you really do start living in another world and you really do start um, seeing everything with like different eyes. And that's not just, that's not just, woo. that's not woo. -woo. That's if you really are doing it, that's, that's what will happen. And um, I think that's why it's important to really be aware. It's one of the things, again, we talk about so much here, but you know, really, being present in your, in your spiritual endeavors and your praxis, you know, it's like, I think it's really important to, you know, kind of, I, I, forgive me. I think that's why guidance is important again, because, you know, we, we were talking a couple weeks ago about the trainer and the trainer, like, you know, that one last rep, you know, not five more, but just like that one last more rep. It's like, it really is. It really does make a difference having some measure of accountability because if you're not, you know, it's like, I just see it often. I don't say, oh, I see it all the time, but I see it often where people are spinning their wheels. And then it's just like, they get to me like, hey, this and that. I'm like, oh, you're spinning your wheels, man. Just do it, do this. And it's like, oh, and then they take off. You know, they, they get traction, they start moving, you know. It's not me. It's just that I am that kind of objective outside viewer that they haven't had to say like, oh, look, you're doing this. You know what I mean? Just try this. So. I, I, um, 
on this this topic of of being there, I've been thinking the last couple of weeks about this, especially related to uh, related to the brothers here who are young, and also related to like my own kids, and thinking about um, you know my. It's it, it, there's a constant thing for me. We've talked about like this rock bottom, you know, and it's like it's th- there's constantly for me my ability to stay oriented toward and and fight to stay oriented toward Christ. I, I think is really super aided by the fact that I led such really such a terrible life and like paid such costs for it, and so it's very easy. Like it's right, it's right there all the time, right? And I know that this is probably like with recovery as well, too, right? That it's like it's playing the tape, it, playing the yeah, tape through, yeah, yeah. That that you could be like, you know what? If I if I move my gaze from this, like I know where I go, I know who I am, I know what I'm capable of. There's no question in my mind that I can slip back into that in a heartbeat if I don't keep up my praxis, if I don't keep my orientation the way that it is, and it's i i wonder and i have some you know i i would i would love some thoughts father with with you as uh uh both a spiritual father and then a father of of so many kids like i obviously you obviously can't push you know suffering on to, to somebody or maybe maybe you can but i don't think that i would want it i don't think that, i don't think that i would want to push somebody to rock bottom just mm-hmm. so that they could maintain their orientation right and that was but something. it's like do yeah. you understand where i'm trying yeah, to go I, like I, how can, do, I can't i can't this is good because i'm like okay i got a little bit of lift here this is good so first of all you don't need to have rock bottom okay you don't need to have rock bottom. Um, and this may be interesting, right? Because um, if we go there, I might give some of my kind of perspectives that, you know, the masses don't really have, but only like mm. people get. So we'll see. But you don't need rock bottom. Um, there's two paths. And I would say, um, you know, this is very much in the sense of, you know, what could motivate someone to serve Christ? This is like what could motivate someone for like monasticism, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's the path of repentance and there's a path of purity. And they, they interchange, they, they intersect, right? But this path of purity, um, we don't talk about often because very few have it. But that's an even more powerful offering. Let me submit this to you, Samuel, you know, the judge, um, uh, you know, the the prophet, excuse me. Um, Samuel was dedicated to the Lord um, from his mother's womb. And if you remember Hannah, you know, speaking of women crying, (laughs) we're talking about women crying, wondering why God hasn't given them uh, suffering, visitation. You know, Hannah is the kind of like inverse of that, or they are the inverse of Hannah, if you will. Um, Hannah, you know, the mother of Samuel, she is, you know, uh, at the temple and she's um, she's crying. And the high priest Eli is kind of like, what are you doing? Are you drunk? She's like, I'm not drunk. I'm, I'm sad because I'm barren. And Eli is basically like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. God's heard your prayer, just go away. You know, God's heard your prayer, go away. And she's like, thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, God hears her prayer. So interestingly enough, a little side note, you know, nobody wants the Bible study, but I'll give it anyways. You know, it's interesting because, you know, Hannah is just taking the word of the priest, even though it's inferred in the text that Eli wasn't necessarily, you know, directly like trying to comfort her, right? But nevertheless, as the high priest through the office, the spirit prophesies, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's a whole nother topic. So she conceives as this child, Samuel, and, you know, her, this whole prayer of, 
If you give me a child, Lord, I'll dedicate him to you. So as soon as it was possible, Samuel is dedicated to the Lord and he's brought to, um, he's, he's, he's brought to the priest. <clears throat> and so he serves uh, in the Holy of Holies, you know, well, not the Holy of Holies, but he's serving in the court. And, you know, he grows up there serving um, Eli, you know, and um, Eli has these two sons, Hophni and Phineas, who are um, foul, cardinal young men um, who would um, cheat the people of their sacrifices and fornicate and do all this stuff. And Samuel being present to all this is still, you know, faithful. And um, one night, the Lord, you know, calls Samuel in the middle of the night. Samuel. Samuel. And he's like, huh? And he runs over to Eli. He's like, Eli, did you call me master? He's like, no, I didn't call you. Get out of here. Goes back to bed. Samuel. Samuel. He's like, what, what? Goes back. Same thing. Just get out of here. And then he's, Eli re realizes, oh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If you hear it again a third time, say, speak, Lord, your servant hears you. So he goes to bed a third time. Samuel, Samuel, and boom. He says, speak, Lord, your servant hears you. And the Lord prophesies and speaks to Samuel, namely about the, the fall of Eli because of his unwillingness to chastise his children. Now you see how this is going to like, this is answering on multiple levels. Do you see mm -hmm. this? Right? Mm -hmm. So the first level is that Samuel served the Lord faithfully, faithfully. Right. And if I get too much of a rabbit trail before we leave Samuel, make sure we come back because there's a whole another twist with Samuel. Right. But the first thing is Samuel's that path of purity. So, you don't know it. Nobody really knows it, but I'll just kind of give you the, the category to make it easy. Most parents wish that their child would be like a Samuel who isn't defiled by the world, who isn't defiled by the, 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 um, the, the passions that assail youth, right? This is Samuel. This is purity. And this being set apart is, is the higher path. It's blessed. You know, it's blessed. It's powerful. Um, that path of, you know, purity is um, so endearing, especially to the mother of God who values purity. Um, but to Christ, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, um, it's something that there are few, there, I mean, there really isn't anything like it that in which, you know, um, attracts the Lord is that, is that purity. Um, now that being said, you know, um, it's interesting because Eli, uh, his refusal to chastise his sons ends up being the downfall. You know, the, the ark is, captured by the Philistines because of it. And of course, God has his own plans with it. But you know, this is, they would not heed the, the tradition, the law. They took the ark into battle and they shouldn't have been messing with the ark. But because Eli refused to bring that suffering to their children, great evil fell upon Israel. So this is another good lesson because there's this path of purity, right? The path of Samuel. And there's this need that sometimes if a child has begun to become wayward, and it doesn't matter whether it's a biological child or a spiritual <laughs> child, there needs to be a chastisement that's brought, right? And that suffering of the chastisement is the act of love that needs to happen. Um, and that's a whole other thing that... I think a lot of people get twisted. I think there's a lot of context that's missing. I know as much as I can be an English speaker. So I'm at, I'm at a woeful disadvantage like everyone else um, because I'm not reading 
you know, the kind of hidden text from like St. Porfidios that's in Greek. You know, I don't, I just, I don't have access to it. But everything that is, is there, St. Theothander Clus, St. Porfidios, St. Baesios, uh, you know, these, these core, you know, I think very illuminating writings speaking about upraising the children, St. John Chrysostom, they're all very clear. And I think people can read it and they can get a misunderstanding that there's this, um, especially if you're reading Porfidios, where it's this idea that, like, no, no, you just let the kid do whatever. Just let the kid do whatever. I think that's a misreading of what they're saying because (laughs) there's a big, 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 big context that's there. And there's a big, big, big context of where we're at. And I I think that um, just in general, people have a problem when they don't understand that you're not supposed to um, copy the life of St. Porfirios. You're supposed to emulate it. But ultimately, you need to have the life of Jimmy Jam and of, you know, Nikki Lou and whoever you are. That's what you need to do because that's what God's calling you to do. And I think when people want to emulate the saints in a improper way, it's disingenuous and it's problematic because what they're trying to do is actually have a um, a playbook. They're trying to have an instruction manual versus a relationship. Uh, And it leads it. This is where you get these weird distortions. This is where you get these weird distortions where people grow up and they may be good robots and automatons, but they don't even have the basics of Christian doctrine. They don't even have the basics of like how to, they've never even like really encountered Christ, you know, um, although they've been in church their whole life. Yeah. So that's where I think some of this can come from. But anyway, I digress. So this is the thing with um, Eli. But interestingly enough, you know, there, there's something here, which we got to be careful because none of it's a slam dunk. And that's, again, that's the big problem. People want slam dunks. They want, give me the magic formula so that if I do this, there's no problems ever. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of Samuel's life, Samuel is like one of those rare figures that goes to the grave. Like, you know, I don't mean this in the little sense, but like sinless. You know what I mean? There's no real huge hiccups when you look at the life of Samuel. But you know what's interesting? It says that, and Samuel's children knew not the Lord. Hmm. Mm. See, that's, yeah. Mm. Yeah, 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 mm. yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. I have I have racked my mind over this for, I feel very comfortable, as kind of great as it sounds, I'll put money on it. I've racked my mind over that for decades. Decades. Um, and again, because I'm at a disadvantage, I'm sure there's some secret Slavonic text by, you know, a father, which I can't read and don't know about, that gives some really great kind of like exegesis on that piece of scripture. I've yet to find it. Um so I'm sure if someone can clickly clack out there and be like, oh, read this, Father, and I'll thank you for it, you know? Um, I'm not sure if I could name it. I'm, I'm sorry, Father. I'm not sure if I could name it, but I mm-hmm. think I've encountered maybe something like what the fault there would be in some priests. Is like, I don't know if I could name it, because I think anything I would say would be kind of dis Like, it wouldn't be the full message, mm-hmm. but it'd be like, it would be like, yeah, I have a good relationship with God. I'm doing the things that I need to do. But there's this like um, allowance that happens with the children. It, it's it's different than Eli, like not a willing to chastise, but it's like it doesn't translate to other people. Like because there's certain saints, from what I understand, who are not good confessors. They are very good at being a saint, but they cannot confess people. Mm-hmm. So it's like the, the this particular connection to the Holy Spirit, to the kingdom of heaven is great, but it doesn't like there's no Wi-Fi from it. You know what I mean? Like no one else is necessarily picking up around. I don't know. Like I've just experienced something like that with priests. It's like it seems like you're great, but I'm getting nothing from you. Like it seems like you, you yeah. know God. Well, well, I think I think part of the thing to that is. People have a wrong understanding of just what a saint is anyways. 
And I think that we have a, like a weird garbage pail kid approach. It's like saints where, and I don't know that some of this is like that kind of, um, I'm, I'm trying to be charitable here. I don't know if some of it is that like, that uh, Catholic stereotype that may not even really exist, but we have it in regards of like, Oh, I'm the saint of peanut butter. You know what I mean? This, this idea that like, Every saint has to have a specific thing and just like God needs to have a saint to cover every little facet of, of existence. And Which is kind can... of pagan, actually. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that pagan? That's yeah. pagan. Yeah. 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 And it's it's really problematic because what happens is people forget. It's like, okay, it isn't necessarily like oh, man, someone's gonna argue with me on this one, but that's okay. Um we can pick any saint and be like. You know, St. Maximus the Confessor. Why is he a saint? Because he's a confessor. Because he confessed the faith. And in in the face of incredible persecution, had his hand cut off and his tongue cut out. Okay? We just go down the line, right? And go like, their name tells you exactly where they're saying. And I would argue, my point here is what I'm trying to argue is like, actually, no. What I'm trying to argue is that they're a confessor because they're a saint. Is what, I, is what I'm trying to say. Because I think this is really important that people don't understand either. What in common terms is called the beatification, which is a whole Catholic thing. But just the glorification of a saint, it, that's, that's the blessing and the amen of, of the, the church, which is important. I'm not saying it's not. It's, 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 it's necessary. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's so many saints that we don't know. There's more saints that we don't know than we do know. Right. And that kind of proves the point of what I'm trying to get at is why did St. John have a golden tongue? Why was he the golden mouth? Because he was a saint, not the other way around. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Because what is a saint? A saint is someone who is, you know, the, the, the halo, the wedding ring. They're married to God. And, and God is married to them. That's what, that's what a saint is. You know, I feel very comfortable saying that, you know? And so when we make it a kind of utilitarian thing, it gets problematic, right? It gets problematic. And I say that because your experience of like, yeah, it's like, I mean, it makes sense because ultimately the rise and the fall of someone is, are they connected to God or not? And that being connected to God it doesn't necessarily guarantee that everyone else around you is going to get connected. Now, St. Sarah from Sarab, acquire the spirit of peace, a thousand around you be saved. Absolutely. You know? But not necessarily everyone. But not necessarily everyone. Yeah. And, and everyone being saved doesn't mean that everyone's packing grace like you got. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Right. Right? right. So, so I, think, I think that's, that's an important thing. This is just important distinctions. Because when you start talking about getting back to like kind of what you're getting at in regards of these two paths, right? Purity and, 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 and repentance, purity and penance, you know, sanctification, sanctification and suffering. Um, it's like, they're not mutually exclusive, obviously, but like there's, we can kind of see this, um, you know, a great, contrast to Samuel's we just had his feast day on Sunday St. Moses right like you know when you think of repentance who do you think of you think St. Mary of Egypt and St. Yep. Moses the Black you yep. know those 100%. are 100% those are like these great saints of repentance and it's like that hitting of rock bottom is incredibly powerful um and I would say that you know there's something to be said for the fact that um, it's not like people who enter in. Okay, so you can you can never have, um, you know, physically carnally, you know, um, cease to be a virgin. You 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 could have like never slept with someone, but that doesn't mean like you're a virgin. Saint Basil says this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I, I think also too, it's important to, to understand what we're talking about because you know. How is it that St. Mary of Egypt became the bride of Christ? How is it that she became pure? You know what I'm saying? That there's these, these paradoxes. But 
I think it's important because there's so many of us now in these last days that have been just ravished and defiled um, by sin, by the world, by the devils. And we, so many people have suffered, just suffered. And I think that this is, you know, this is why God revealed Sophroni in particular um, to make a path for us. You know, that the rock bottom is a way in which we can, you know, enter into the, the sufferings of Christ and enter into a canonic experience if, if we're willing to, you know. Hey, Father, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to expand on what you just said about St. Sophroni, what in relation to rock bottom. So St. Sophroni um, is like the saint of the modern era, in my, in my opinion, because of the profound suffering that he experienced in regards of, you know, experiencing the horror and the trauma. And I mean that not in the kind of weird, but like the actual trauma of, of life on a hypostatic level. So it wasn't just the kind of in, like um, individualistic experience of like, I lost my brother in the war, right? But that hypostatic, that, that, if you will, kind of being jacked into the, the bigger framework of mankind, right, that allowed him to experience the suffering of the World War, um, the suffering of the dissolution of, of the frameworks of culture um, and human experience, which in of itself is a profound terror and trauma that people aren't even aware of. Much of the kind of like noise in the back, it's kind of like, Imagine just like all of a sudden someone just hits like that dead quiet and they kind of like go mad and they don't realize, oh, there's just been this crazy white noise going on Mm. the whole time, my whole life. I didn't realize it. Right. And that's that there's this thing, there's this app running in the background that people aren't aware of because people are are operating in frameworks that are um, destroyed. People are operating in frameworks that are malformed mutilated, um, ill-fitting, poisoned. You know what I mean? It's like people are people are swimming in poison lakes, running in poison glens and forests, um, psychologically, spiritually, they don't they and they don't know it. Right? It's just it's it's been what they've been raised in. And so it's a soup. They're just they're they're it's they're you're in a complete soup and it's yeah. you and and you think that and it is interesting as we were talking about like being sick and one of the things that that I that I feel like many times suffering like extended suffering where I've really been incapacitated one of the things that it has helped to do is to like really lay bare the fact that it it almost like shows the soup because I think when you're in the soup long enough like you stop noticing that the world is is like tinted yeah. by the color of the soup if that makes sense i know i'm like probably extending this oh, metaphor like you're wearing out. a pair of dirty glasses so long you take it yes. off and suddenly yeah. oh my god like that yeah, exactly. like that yeah it's exactly, exactly it's exactly like that and people don't even realize it and this gets back to because people don't they don't understand I, I know i say that all the time whatever but i i mean it you know it's like people don't understand sin Right. And it's like this is this is this is the big danger about people reading about this stuff, but not having praxis, people reading about this stuff, but not being able to have the means to really have someone kind of show them how this plays out. Because so many people, they'll talk all day long about Western and Eastern, you know, approaches and Western captivity. But it's like they don't I I mean, this with all charity, they really don't know what they're talking about because you look at them. And they live their life as a moralist anyways. That everything is about the moral infraction. And the problem with that is you never get into like this deeper level of just like disease, right? And that's why people can go long periods of time of abstinence and still be suffering from their passions, still be suffering from the disease of sin, right? This, this is why, you know, I, I just want to real quick, don't let me get too far off into this, right? Because I feel like we are a community cover Samuel. But I want to get too off, far off into this. But like 
do want to give just like a real quick shout out to David Garnoski in the sense that um, he, he, I think he's onto something really good in the sense that there is a quote unquote anthropological um, framework or lens that is missing from a lot of people's spirituality and the religious experience, right? It's not the it's not the lens, it's not the framework by which to see everything, but it is a it is like one of the lenses that I think people should have. And the reason why I say that is because we have an for us, because we have we are living in that broken, distorted, malformed, mutilated social framework, right? Which isn't just our customs. It's our mind, it's our mindset. Are you are you following me? An anthrop- 100%, yes. A proper anthropological like framework in regards to the gospel would be kind of like that crutch or that medicine to help us understand sin at the level that I'm talking about in regards of just moving it out of the um, individu- individualistic, hyper-individualistic and inf- you know, moral infraction and more into this connected sense of Yes, what I do does matter, but not just for me in regards of like the mean God who's looking to like judge me on every single thing, but the fact that I am bringing more greed into the world. I am bringing yep. more, right? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That's, so- that, that's father. That's so huge. Like that is, it's the, it's the lack of connectedness mm-hmm. and, and, and it, it, I think it manifests itself and it, and it, the obviously the best way for us to describe it, the where we understand what we're talking about, is like a, a moralistic mm-hmm. sort of idea. But really, what it is is exactly like you said. It's almost like you could almost view it as like narcissistic, to where yeah. to where they say, "Oh, I'm going to clean this up," and it's very I, much in line. Yeah, yeah. it's very I, much in line with mm-hmm. like a red pill sort of situation. Like, I'm going to clean this up yeah. for myself. Because then I'm going to be better, more powerful, not going to be punished by God, all of these yeah. different things, as opposed to like. So, so let me stop you right the, there. The, the, connect, the connection to everything. Yeah. Let me stop you right there because let's just connect this, you know, and thanks be to God for the Holy Spirit. Let's connect, let's connect this to, we were talking about St. Paisios earlier. And St. Paisios doing what? Taking on the chores of his brethren to his own detriment. Why? Do you think St. Paisius was like, hey, I'm going to do these obediences because I want to level up? He's not thinking about leveling no, up. No, 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 no. Well, he but wouldn't I mean, be a saint if he was. Exa- exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so and so that kind of connects that because, again, you know, this idea of just like wanting to level up and blah, blah, blah. It's like I maintain this. And this has always been my frustration. Um always been my frustration and it's it was my frustration when i was an evangelical uh and it's it's i'm still frustrated by it but not really because things are different i'm different obviously but it, it's still kind of like a hope of mine is you know i mean i mean honestly this, you could almost boil it down that's why i'm doing this project because i do believe that the potential is real for people to wake up and to actually be the body of Christ, right? Because to me, that's the thing is like, once you find the church and once you join in with the body of Christ, then it's like, okay, I get it. We're all going through our purification. I get it. You got to learn affect. You got you got to learn the, the language. You, you've joined a tribe. You've joined a kingdom. I get it. Like, I'm not faulting anybody. But man, just like, don't stay there because at some point in time, it's like, if 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 Orthodox Christians, all these people that are converting, all these people that are converting, it's like I I wonder about this. I was talking to, I don't know. Forgive me, forgive me if you hear this. And I know people might trip out on it, but I I was talking to my talking to my friend, um, who's in a really really great um, he was in a really great band, and. You know, he's him and his beautiful family. They're getting baptized. I'm really excited. And I was talking to him today and he was saying how like, you know, some of his people are coming in 
and I'm excited. And I actually, I got really kind of excited because, but I'm hoping, and I told them just, you know, not in any word self-important thing, but I said, just reach out because I'm hoping that that zeal he has for people to want to just do this thing and, and really be authentic in, in the love and expression of the gospel and of Christ. I hope that, that do, I, I just want to do everything I can, which is why we do this project, so that that zeal people have doesn't get snuffed out by the wrong things, by either trying to become orthodox, but like you lose your, lose your Christianity, or by like all the weird stuff that we talk about. You know what I mean? Because I know that with all these people that are coming into the church now and all these, you know, these people are doing podcasts and papers and all this stuff about like, well, all these people con- converting and it just kind of like, it makes me laugh at first. It's absurd because I'm like, well, people converting because they want Jesus Christ and they yeah. want salvation. Yeah. And there's no other place for salvation. So if you're writing a paper about converts, if you're doing the whole thing on converts and the phenomenon of converts, I would encourage you just stop. <laughs> and actually put your energy into forwarding the kingdom, right? Um, so anyways, so that being said, I'll get my high horse and I'll just say this. I really do believe with every fiber of my being that when people actually take seriously the gospel and, and subsequently the church, that the world around them does change. And I don't mean in some weird, you know, um, overt i don't know what the word is at the time right now like trying too hard i don't mean it like that i mean if you actually just start to try to live this out authentically in repentance it is it's powerful like that's how you start packing the grace and you're not because you're not even thinking about it you're just wanting to love god and be loved by god you're just wanting to actually repent from not loving people you're actually just wanting to repent from being you know, broken because we're all broken because of the framework, right? And so that ability, if, if all these people that are coming in were, you know, given the tools to, yes, be sober, yes, be made aware through through catechetical efforts of, of your improper doctrine, your improper dogmas, learn the dogmas of the church, learn the traditions of the church because they matter, they're not superfluous, don't pick and choose, do everything you can to actually imbibe the tradition of the church for the love of Christ. And then when you do that, then you have the boundaries and the framework by which you can, you can now handle the grace of God and be in the world and really be light to the world. Because that's, that's why he hasn't come yet. You know what I mean? He hasn't come yet because the time of the Gentiles hasn't been fulfilled. He hasn't come yet because there's still there's still numbers to be added. He hasn't come yet because there's right. So it's like, until he comes, like we got, we should be about his business. And I just, I just get the sense sometimes that people are just not about the business of the kingdom. Um, they're about something else. And what do they get about? They get about these weird, you know, it's like people want the Jesus prayer. They don't want Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like yes. people, yeah, you know what I mean. People, people want techniques. You know, they want an icon, but they don't want Christ. And like, I know, like, people, are, someone's gonna lose their mind, and they're gonna think I'm real, whatever. I don't even care. You know what I mean? I'm telling you're you, you're speaking the truth. You're speaking the truth, Father. I mean, this was this was for me one. This is one of the reasons why I just why I had to leave social media, right? That it was like I recognized my own temptation toward that. And that and how powerful and how strong of a habit it had been for me that like even it was like I I was so I was so blind and in some ways uh, helpless to my own temptations if I let them run wild to be like, you know, that that I would I would want to let's say I would want to share and celebrate, let's say, every uh, new realization or revelation or or aspect of of my you know changing but then that would flip real quick the second that because then it becomes like oh well am i bragging about it yeah am i like what am i like it it flips so fast like the opportunity for that to be to to be corrupted 
happens so very fast. And and I had some concern, I think, about, oh, well, here I've had this platform. And I know that there's other other Orthodox people struggling with this right now, that it's like who have a platform and who feel like, oh, well, I would never give that platform up because it's it's been crucial to like bringing other people to Christ. But, you know, what's been interesting about me being off of social media like it hasn't slowed down the number of people who have who will reach out to me and be like, hey, you know, the the little spark, the little influence that you gave. And now we're getting baptized. We're getting baptized. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't I didn't even need the Twitter account at the end of the day because it wasn't even me doing it in the first place. I think that I think that's a pretty like and I don't fault you, Cyprian, because I definitely, definitely thought that way when I first entered the church and in many ways you are much more mature than me when you entered the church. But I think that like, that was something, at least a commonality right now that I was like, well, you know, I would say things like, you know, I can't, I know things coming off the top of my head, but certainly that, that spirit of like understanding, like, you know, no, we need to find these practical ways of making sure that we can reach people. And yes, there's a time and a place for that. And social media would be this great place to do it and stuff. But like at the end of the day, like there's this thought and I I haven't really explored it too much. And so I'm sure you guys are already aware of it, but there is no bias in the media. The bias lays within the individual. So it's like, so whatever, whatever, you know, extremist, you know, on either end, quote unquote, blah, 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 will report whatever story. And then the person seeing that story, it's ultimately like they're the final judge and how they're interpreting that information. If I put stuff out there, like what you're talking about, where I'm realizing like, oh my gosh, like this is a lot more than lip service. I'm actually having to die to myself, like having to like, you know, actually share my progress via some blog or something like that. And whatever, I'm sure there's a time and a place for that. But like if somebody's like having to, if somebody's doing something like that and someone comes along who's like not ready to be in a place, like they're not going to receive it. Like they're never going to receive it. And like even the lukewarm people that you have like a shot open, like the Sons of Peterson or whatever, you have a shot of getting in there, I think really at the end of the day, it was kind of AA that opened me to the idea of like attraction rather than promotion. Like the, 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 it's like the idea of like, well, people have been coming to the church for thousands of years and social media has only been around for like 20, you know? So like, yeah, here's this great tool, blah, blah, blah. We're literally on YouTube and whatever right now. So, you know, just bear in mind, I am totally aware of that. But at the same time, like, I think that like people can get really caught up in the practicalities that they can lose like the heart of the matter. And I, and I know fathers encouraged uh, and encountered this where someone's like, okay, so we're going to do a, and it's all logically sound of what they can do, but somewhere along the way, something is lost. Like something is like, I don't know. We've lost the heart of the matter. And I think that like for all the good that social media can do, I I mean, I don't know. I just, I'm always going to take the stance. I think it does more harm than good. So I think, Ultimately, you ended up at the same place that I did, but it's more just like, I think I've already thought that way, but I think it's the work of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that like, I'm like, I just don't know if it works like that. Like, you know, I just think people are coming and it's great, but at the end of the day, you know, like you got, you got to throw some fish out. There are some fish, you know, you're going to catch a giant haul of fish, but you know, like, I think St. Nikolai, well, I mean, mean, look, look, I, I, I I think a lot about this, right? And I'm one of those people, and I guess I just stand by the stuff because just because for me it, it's it's a reality. But like, we'll just take um, okay. Just bear with me on this one. I I think one of the problems is that if we think about like fishing and ministry and like blah blah blah, like what is it, right? And so we default into like, it's about evangelism. Well, okay. Yeah. But that's just like one aspect. Okay. Like, so evangelism is let's say catching the fish. Right. But then that's not cleaning it. You got to clean the fish. You got to cook the fish. You got to eat the fish. And then what do you You got to serve the fish? You got to store the fish. You You got so so many things. (laughs) And so, and so like the reason why I'm saying this is because like, like, this will be one perfect for us right now, like like music, right? And I know people are like, ah, whatever, music, blah, blah. I, I'm telling you, 
for everybody else, for the you know the 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 ninety people that watch this show, whatever, like all you know, eighty nine eighty nine people who watch this show, and all eighty nine of them, including you two, could be like ah, whatever about music, no problem. But for me, you know, and one other person, I'm telling you, man, like there have been these, there's been music and and God's used it in my life to to really get me through things to help me um, go deeper. Like it's been like an aid. It's been like a help, right? It's not the thing. It's not the thing. What I'm trying to get at is there's all kinds of things that are involved in the, you know, propagation of the gospel and the maintaining of in the life of someone. Because I think that's what a lot of people forget is that, you know, there's the initial grace that people encounter, but then so many people lose it. You know what I mean? I mean, forgive me, I'm just going to go there. Like, think about where you were at when you and I first connected, Andrew. Like, you were... You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? And so I, I'm really big on that because, and again, too self-aware, I don't know, wearing your own band's t-shirt on stage, maybe that's what's happening right now. I don't know. But for me, a big part of this is like, it's like one part evangelism, like trying to reach people, right? Because initially like, oh yeah, people in the libertarian to orthodox pipeline and kind of addressing them and like new people coming in and sons of peterson and you know people post woke and all that stuff yes for sure but you know what i'm almost i've almost more focused on people that were kind of like where andrew was at when i met him or people that were you know kind of trying to hang on they're trying to make sense of it they don't want to ditch the church but they're like is this it and and like that's that's for me almost more important because there's way better, I don't know, maybe there's way more attractive and better people that can be like, hey, check out whatever. You know, it's like, um, it's like, forgive me how it sounds, whatever. It, it's not a dig. It's just whatever. It's like, yeah, you know, like Jay Dio will bring into the church, but I'll keep you in the church. That's kind of like my, that's my approach. You know, I'm all about keeping people in the church. I'm all about saying, no, 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 no. Okay, great. When you're past arguing about denominations, you know, when you're past, you know, geeking out on, you know, rando, you know, obscure schismatic bishop that did some weird, when you're past that and you're trying to figure out how to stay married because your wife is ready to leave you, you know what I'm saying? And like you're ready to like let go of Christ and just become you know, a Cuban drug lord, when when you're there, that's where I really want to be like, no, 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 great. Let's actually see how all this matters. Does, that, does this make sense? Mm-hmm. I, and I think, it's, I think it's really, really important because, you know, it's the dirty secret that nobody, look, I've talked about it before. I was in a community that that was the dirty secret was attrition rate. And I'm going to tell you another thing. That's the dirty secret that no one wants to talk about with all these numbers of people coming in. There's going to be an attrition rate. There's going to be attrition rate in which. Well, there's you- a kind of an attrition rate. Forgive me, Father. Uh, in in just even among cradle orthodox orthodox. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm married to a Russian woman, yeah. and I mean, what I found interesting is is how long. You know, I I had a a great insecurity with the fact that like I was the person in the house who was the new mm-hmm. convert. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like my wife and my kids were were orthodox way before me, my wife her whole life. Right. But what's what's been interesting is that. It's been in the last, let's say, only in the last maybe four months that on a regular basis now, when I'm going to pray my prayer rule that my wife is now saying, can I come pray with you? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Just. Mm-hmm totally apropos of nothing without me because i never i mean and i had a little bit of insecurity about that too of like i never really felt that it was appropriate for me to be like 
telling my wife to be praying or Mm -hmm. more inviting my wife to pray, which I, which I would on occasion, but now she's the one. You were a real St. Paul. You like really had to like prove yourself time and time again. You're like, no, I deserve to be here. And be like, we've been here. You're like, no, I deserve to be here. Like, Father pointed it out. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Cyprian, No, continue. no, no. I'm done. I'm done. I think I've I've said, but but I I think the point that I was trying to make was like, you know that 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 attrition can even be happening like in in an Orthodox home. There can be oh, that yeah. attrition. Oh yeah, and, and and honestly, forgive me. I just, it's not even like I stand corrected because that's not what I was saying at all. Because just attrition happens. Period. You know, like, I mean, listen, I remember, whatever, who cares, you know, I I remember when I, back in the day, uh, when I was, you know, tattooing and all that stuff, and everyone knew it's like my, yeah, my booth was like, even before I had my own shop, my booth was like, you know, just Christian stuff, then eventually Orthodox stuff everywhere, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I remember someone, you know, uh, this person, like, oh, this is great. Is this how you witness to people? And I didn't even think of it that way. I was like, no, this is how I, this is how I stay in the game because I need this, you know, like I, I need this. And, and I think that's the biggest thing is like, if you, if you are aware and you don't forget what God's done for you, which is, you know, by God's blessing, that's all I've tried to do. You just dig your heels in, in the right way. And you just say, okay, man, like, I'm all in on this. I'm, I'm all in. All the chips, here you go. And because there's really no other way. There's, there's really no other way because when you don't do that, I don't care who you are. It, you, you can slip. You can slip, Right. And so, you know, that's a kind of little tip for everybody is you want a beefy prayer rule not to level up. You want a beefy prayer rule if that's where you're at so that you can stay connected to Christ. That, that's the purpose. It isn't, it isn't for anything else but that. And I think this is important because as lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. How are you going to preserve yourself from your heart growing cold? You know what? You thinking that you and uh, whatever else, you know, are going to, like, hold the fort down? You're not going to hold the fort down, man. Because as you see more and more people, it doesn't even have to be, like, wild teenage youth running wild in your city. It could be the same corruption in your local school or or whatever it is. You see what I'm saying? When lawlessness abounds, the love of men grow cold. That's one of the signs of the of of the days, and everyone's seeing it. Everyone's feeling it, right? How do we navigate that? How do we how do we find ourselves in a place where our heart doesn't grow cold? This is what we're talking about. Because what is attrition, right? What is that attrition rate? It's essentially the heart growing cold and then leaving. Does that does that make sense? What I'm saying, you know? So, yeah. so I, I think I think the thing is is like this is important because again whoop de whoop but you know communism they didn't communism was like catching the cold it's like i don't know how this happened how did we get how did we get so sick you, you know what i mean it's like oh maybe it's because i walked to the airport it's like no you know what i mean that's how you got like communism wasn't just like oh some random fluke right the russian heart grew cold and the russian heart grew cold the russian heart the russian People had all kinds of pietistic movements and all kinds of externals and everything else, but there was an attrition rate of the heart and then the judgment came. So getting back to the child and getting back to the rock bottom, right? Like that's the thing is God chases those whom he loves, right? I'm just saying that, you know, you could wise up a little bit and be like, I know temptations have to come. I know I, you know, I want to be chastened because that proves that I'm a son, but I want to get that ratio down really low. You know what I mean? I want to get it to where 
I'm not having to get spanked all the time, right? I, I want to make sure that I'm being obedient as much as I can, right? I want to make sure that I'm not forgetting God. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm not ending up being a biff. You know, a biff, you know? Like, yeah. Where, where's my car, daddy? Yeah. Where, where was my car, father? You know, and like that's how people approach the thing, the things of God, the things of, of the church. It's like, oh, don't you know the prayer rule I've been doing, God? Where are yeah. you? You know, just like stuff like that. And, and, I, and those are people who've never suffered. Not like they should, you know, not like they need to. I Here, I know. Go, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead. Daddy. <laughs> that's so great. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think that that's like, um, I think that's what I was trying to say is like it. I don't necessarily like get torn up like that. The story of the woman crying because Christ hasn't uh, visited any sufferings upon her in three years or whatever. It is definitely unnerving. <laughs> when things are start going good for a while when it's been like three or four months and there hasn't been any major crises or anything or maybe not even major crisis, like just the day in and day out of like raising small children is, you know, that's very, very difficult enough. Like, and when things are going good and like things have been going good for a while, it is kind of like unnerving. And it's not even cause it's like, when's the bad thing going to happen? It's like, it's not like that, but it is a little bit like, um, man, something's not right here because this is not, this is not what I was like kind of told it was going to be, you know? And with that, like, well, the, you know, the tension, there's a lack of tension. That's that's because, yeah, I am. There's, a cut, there's cut, there's comfort, right? So that, so then there can't be growth if there's yeah. no tension. And honestly, it's like, I tell people, you know, it's one of my sayings. People ask me like, Hey, how you doing? And I'm like, just enough temptations to know I'm on the right side. You know what I mean? And that's what you want. You want just enough temptation to know that like the devil's not happy with you. Like yeah. you don't want that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's father. That's, I know exactly what you're saying. There. When, that, like that is the truth. Yeah. Yes. When the like peanut gallery or whoever, like the Greek chorus in my head is like agreeing with me. I'm like, okay, something's up. Like, I'm like, I'm yeah. not if like, if everyone's like, yes, yes, yes. This is what the thing you should be doing this when I'm like mm -hmm. firing because uh, I'm not going to go on about this. That's the thing that I think is the most unnerving about being around someone who is on a very, very good upper drug is that they manic. are yeah, manic, but they are a hundred percent convinced what they are doing at all times it's, is it's the right very thing. appropriate. It's very important. Yeah. And that in like, and that, that's like one of the first things that has to kind of go. You have to instill doubt within yourself. Like, because that doubt is like the bumper that keeps you kind of like in the middle. It's like, well, I don't know if this is the good thing, you know, like we'll see. It's like that parable or whatever, uh, well, not parable, but the, um, the little story of the guys, like your son's going to war and he's like, well, it could be a good thing. Could be a bad thing. Your son goes to war and then, you know, dies and he's like well could be a good thing could be a bad thing you, you know you guys know what i'm talking about yes yeah yeah okay yeah because yeah. yeah, it's like this whole like well we don't really know how this is going to play out we will see the long game on, on what's going on because if you are 100 percent sure all the time that the thing that's happening to you is good or bad then you know where's the room for correction mm -hmm. you know like that, the, that, the correction has to be more severe that manic self-assuredness is one of the things that when I look back on who I was in my 30s, that I feel the most shame, shame about mm -hmm. being that person walking through the world because and it, it and I mean, it's the thing, weirdly enough, it's what people are striving for because it's the celebrity mindset, like the celebrity attitude, right? To where it's Andrew Tate. It's, it's it's Andrew Tate. It is, it's it's Andrew Tate and every celebrity and people they want to become famous so that they can behave that way. But what's so weird about it is like, Father, you you would you would use the you would said, you know that the 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 means the means of of the church of tradition of being orthodox is for the end of being the the, the ends of. You know, being able to hold grace mm -hmm. and and be in the world. And it's mm -hmm. like holding grace 
holding grace in the world, you know, it looks like hope. Like that's the thing mm-hmm. is that it's like it's hope. You when you encounter someone, I mean, it's in encountering a, a holy person, right? Is that there's like there's there's hope is like a, a huge piece of that, and that's so much what was missing. And I think it's the thing that is missing from that, like, celebrity aspect is that it doesn't feel like hope. It's this weird, like, they're getting everything, but yet the underlying attitude, the underlying almost, like, presupposition is that everything is horrible. Mm. Like, everything is horrible in the world, but except not for them. Mm-hmm. just for everybody yeah. else and that there's no chance for everybody else. There's only a chance for them because That's, they're the chosen one. Well, what's like, interesting about that is I don't even know if this is something I should talk about because I don't know enough about it, but it was interesting enough that I'll bring it up. And if I'm wrong, then so be it. But there was like this kind of kerfuffle around um what's your boy um uh the rock and oprah and they were doing this thing i guess like some whatever i just caught oh the maui to donate yeah, to the caught, maui like, fire yeah yeah yeah, yeah i yeah. just caught like a skim of it it's just like kind of passed through something once and, it, and it's just like oh that's interesting but this is what i think about because it's weird how and and, and i think this this is something where getting back to that um, kind of anthropological lens is important here in regards to the gospel. This would be great to kind of like, you know, buzz in David Gornoski here and kind of like, what do you think about this? Whatever. Because like, there's something to that. So what you're speaking of in regards of like the elite and everything, you know, it's like they are, they rise above everything and everything terrible is underneath them. And it's a real symbol of injustice, um, which that's a whole thing, right? That's a whole thing. It, it, but it's a real symbol of these things that fomented and brought about democracy. So I'm not going with it where you think I am in that sense, right? It, it's like... um Okay. We, well, forgive we, me, Father, because democracy, no, 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 democracy no, I, presupposes I, corrupt elites, right? Yeah, I, I can't, I can't let you do this. Okay, go if, ahead. Sorry, <laughs> we we need to focus real hard on this one because I I'll lose it. But I think I'm trying to catch this fish right here. So the thing is, is that <clears throat> the it says in the Gospel of Mark, right? that Pilate was aware that the Jews um, gave up Christ because of envy. Because of what, sorry? Envy. Okay. There's in the, in the Gospel of Mark, because of envy. He this discerned is important. That was- Father, would you mind speaking up just a little bit? It's, sorry, it's okay. Sorry. sorry. It's okay. I got, I got real quiet. because. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Oh. And I was like, I'm missing stuff, and I want to hear it. Okay, so because of envy, right? It says in the Gospel of Mark. And then, like, the fathers tell us that, like, the devil fell because of envy. Are you following me? Mm-hmm. So when I look at these elites, quote unquote, and even that term, right? I know everyone knows how this works. Like, we're putting stuff on the board, we're trying to tie the red pins to everything, right? Like, think back. Do you remember watching. Um, Lifestyle, um, rich and famous. No, I'm Robin Lynch. But do you do you do you remember watching the second Batman? Right. Uh, Is that with more... the Danny DeVito, the Penguin? No, 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 no. The, Heath Ledger. Uh, oh no, no, forgive me. It was not Heath Ledger, not that one. Um, uh, the I know Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, with... Andrew. I don't. Yes. <laughs> don't. This isn't. This isn't about the critique, right? Just. Don't... <laughs> Just, just I just want to make sure you're getting your movies correct. That's just all I'm me. trying to do. Because yeah, I know okay. you hate it. I know you hate it. I know you hate it, but just follow me. But remember how there was an underlining kind of like post uh, Wall Street, whatever, like the whole scene with like 
they're tearing down the mansion and um Catwoman, I can't remember what her name was, is um saying to uh, Christian Bale, like, did you think that you'd be able to hide from us forever? And there was, do you remember this? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust yeah. me, I, I'm trying, okay, you guys are following me, right? Yeah. I remember watching that because at the moment you felt like, oh, they're tapping in basically to like this undercurrent that was fomenting, right? And I remember thinking to myself, this is fascinating that it wasn't really in the water like it is now, but it was enough to it's like, oh, right? And so this gets us into the whole like predictive programming and psyop and all that stuff. Okay, that's great, right? But just just follow me, right? Because this this phenomena of the elite, right? You know, kind of sitting above and looking down on everyone else, right? Your boy, The Rock, and Oprah. You know, hey, we got everything, but you give us, but you give my, your money that you don't got. To fix Maui. You see what I'm saying? Crazy. It's, it's so absurd. But watch this. Watch this, right? And I'm not even saying they're doing it on purpose. Because remember, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, right? We, we can forget that. Like, our analysis is not, who cares? Like, your boy Rock, he's just worried about what steak he's going to eat and whatever. You know what I mean? It's the powers behind them, right? So here's the thing. This fomenting, Right? It, it's it's the thing that fomented democracy. If you think about the French Revolution and what the French Revolution means spiritually, right, Jacobin, and you think about like all of these movements and how it infected the world, right, and that infection of the world to be like, no, no, the masses, like, uh, you know, for the people, by the people, of the people, the but the people retarded, right, mm-hmm, like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Think, think about this, right? Okay. All of these things are still there fomenting this bubbling undercurrent, right? Because ultimately what it's facilitating is, is envy. Like we think that it's all about like, oh, you know, the, um, what was the term that uh, Peterson was trying to coin? It just was not good. And people still use it. Um, cultural marxists right remember this cultural postmodern neo-marxists yeah all right? that okay. stuff the cultural okay. marxism yeah cultural marxism and i know people are gonna be like what father no 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 like just just follow me on this right see the problem is is like i understand why the term's employed but like it gets people looking at the wrong hand do you understand what i'm saying because these this isn't these are this is about a spiritual reality that's being fomented, right? The political mm, the po- the way the political manifestation of it is, you know, the the fascia and the bone and everything, but ultimately the spirit of it is the spirit of, of, of envy that's being fomented into the people. Because that spirit of envy is the thing that pulls them to say, no, no, we can be God too. No, 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 no. We want to be God too. And that's ultimately what all this boils down to. Because what does it mean when every every Tom, Dick, and Harry wants to be uh, uh, a celebrity? I got a phone. They all want to I be got a phone. Yep. I'm going to prank you. Like, think about the prank phenomena. And, and, like, think about all these things that people are going to the links of so they can be celebrities. Like, what you were saying about, because what they really want is they want what they think are the accoutrement of fame which is ultimately I get to be the elite and everyone else is the peon. I get to treat you like you're garbage, right? And I get to do whatever I want. Like all of that is this really weird, twisted envy machine that is just cranking. But if you think about what is the spirit, right? So the devil fell because of envy, right? And, the, and it says that, you know, the Jews wanted to kill Christ because of envy. And how do you churn the world in such a way that it it begins to really, you know, chomp at the bit to really want to upend everything once and for all to where we're all going to be God? Because isn't this what's going to be promised to everybody? Isn't this ultimately, and it's the ones who are going to really come against that. And on a super, 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 super low level, it'll just simply be talking about 
you know, things like hierarchy and being like, no, 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 hierarchy is in nature. You know what I mean? Yes. Like real basic level things like that, but getting all the way to just talking about like actually Christ and not Christ consciousness, not all this other antichrist stuff, but being like, no, 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 no. This is, see, this is why they'll come. This is why they will hate us. They won't hate us because of our morality in the sense of we don't smoke or chew or go with girls who do. That's not, that's not the reason why people will begin to hate us, right? The reason why people will begin to hate us is because our mere existence will shine a light on their envy. Our mere existence will shine a light on their wanting to be self-deified, right? To say like, no, 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 we don't need God. We're God in of themselves. And they don't say that. That kid who can barely speak, let alone like read or write, he's not consciously thinking, oh, I want to be God while he's trying to get tons of likes on TikTok. But that's the spirit that's motivating him because he's, he's seeing. Father, some of them are saying those exact words. Yeah. Some of them are, yeah. are literally saying, I am, I am a God. Treat me yeah. like a God. Yeah. Fair and enough. Fair it enough. also, to speak to the orientation real quick from what we were talking about at the beginning, it keeps the orientation completely. Um, and again, I'm coming at this from just a, just an everyday man. This is just the stuff that I see. I have no theological training other than being an Orthodox Christian is it keeps things. It, it actually serves a couple of different things. Father's absolutely correct. Yes. It foments envy 100%. It also keeps things completely materialistic mm -hmm. because what separates me from deification mm -hmm. is money it, that, and like, and I can get money mm -hmm. if I can get worship. And if I can get worship, I could get by, get it get by attention. I get it through social media. And then not only that, then there's that thing that we talked about. Uh, somebody made fun of that. The new creed, the science is real, love is love, blah, blah, blah. But then somebody made it. They made fun of that. And they said, socialism is the gospel of envy. Uh -huh. And like that, like it's, it, it nails it because it, it, it there, you cannot make everyone rich, but what you can do is you can make everybody poor. Mm -hmm. So it's it by its very nature, it's meant to destroy society as we know. It. It's meant to destroy hierarchy by its very nature. So it's it, it's encouraging envy. It, it it turns up the 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 passion of envy. It keeps things in a materialistic perspective. It's like no, not only and some people even approach it like no, it's not even deification. It's happiness. It's 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 um, it's uh, it's the store. It's the man storing up storing up storing up and storing up fool your soul will be required of you tonight like mm -hmm. like it's like no it's this constant like no i'm storing up i'm storing up i need to get more i need to get more and then i'll be happy and it's not even like deification it's like it's like no then i can be happy and then not only that but like it's by its very nature like what did they do the um the kansas city chiefs they did the um <laughs> the black national anthem at the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, at the Kansas City Chiefs game, that they that that they did oh, the national Harrison. anthem, then they did the black national anthem, which is every voice sings differently or something. Like, no, I, lift every voice and sing. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're doing that. They're doing that. That's so. That's sort of a weird flex because that's like pulling way. That's like pulling two generations into the past to bring something forward. It's very very weird. I I don't know anything about it other than I watched a video about it. And oh. it's again, it's this whole idea of like, and like it's in the Joker too, the Joaquin Phoenix, like the emphasis is, is that uh, Thomas Wayne is calling the Joker a clown because he thinks he's targeting rich people. I've only seen the movie once, but there's this part, there's this whole scene where basically if you are siding with Joker, who's a psyop, like that character in and of itself is a psyop, the chaotic but chaotic genius um, who can be completely chaotic, no discipline, but somehow manages to be smarter and better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Being said, I love the Joker, but yes, he's a psyop as well. Um, that like, uh, then everybody who sided with him is like, hold signs, it's like, eat the rich. Like, well, how did this become about class? When did this become about class? At no point, in this movie was this really about class other than they shoehorned this Donald Trump esque Thomas Wayne character. And, and I love that movie. I think it's a great movie. I'm not bashing. I see it for what it is though. It's like, okay, well, 
by its very nature, we have to drag everybody down and there is no peaceful solution to that. That This is not going to be a peaceful transition of power, quote unquote, whatever. It, by its very nature, it's chaos. It's the Joker. It's making everybody equal because we're all pretty much the same in the end. Nobody is it's just like it, it, everybody wants to be the top of the mountain, but they don't realize that being at the top of the mountain means that the only way to make that is to bring the mountain all the way down. And like then then the top's on the bottom and that's where everybody's going to be. And then, mind you, to, to finish up the cap, my long rant, and I'm, I apologize, but like the French Revolution, brought, the father brought up the French Revolution, and what did they end up with but another dictator? That's uh-huh. all that ended up happening. Napoleon did the exact same thing that he set out. He's at, he was like, well, they no. got Robespierre before they got N- Napoleon. I mean, he was well, like, that dude was even, a complete lunatic. That's not even talking about him. Because he's the means by which they just right. ended up being exactly right. where they started out. Where right. N- Napoleon was like, no, congratulations, guys. This is what you fought for. Like, it's me. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I'm your king. And like, emperor. I'm your king. Emperor, yeah, I'm your emperor, yeah. right? <laughs> which also, if, forgive me, and I, I could be wrong, but emperor has the connotation he is the conquering ruler yes. rather than the king. He is 100%. The, he conquered his own country. So congratulations, like, I get it, but congratulations, idiots. Like you have, like, you did exactly what you set out to not to do. And like, I get it. I, I would have done the same thing back then, especially if I'm not Orthodox. I would have done you know, whatever I would have been of the part of the revolution. I would have been part of everything. Da, 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 da. I can't stand in judgment. But it's like, wow, congratulations. This is exactly so. Yeah, but that's but that's the trap. And it was and it was envy because it, it and it's it's in 1984, right? The uh, the pra- what is it? What is it? The print, the, the theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism, the little book within the book, the Emmanuel Goldstein book within the book where he talks about. Uh, yeah, it's what Winston is reading, but it, but when the, he's the waking sec- up or quote unquote, or yeah, whatever. the secret, okay. the secret hidden book and the whole idea or what he says in there is that there's always the high, the middle and the low. And that the middle is always trying to become the high and they're going to use the low to do it. And it's ultimately right. it's about envy, right? Because the, the middle envies the high. And this is this was the same thing that as a minor celebrity, I will tell you nothing got my goat more because I would get to do all kind of cool things. I'd get usually I was walking around and people were asking for pictures of me and everything, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll go into the club. Oh, we get a table. Yeah. Until like an A-list celebrity comes in, right? <laughs> then my own envy would kick in, <laughs> right? And because I'm at this table, but this dude's over, the, and it's like, oh, stole all our girls, stole all our attention. <laughs> so much for being a C-list celebrity now doesn't go very far when Ashton Kutcher's in the house. You know what I mean? Then it's like, forget about it. And then we would all be like, well, let's just go. Let's just leave. This is terrible. And I think that and but it's the same thing like you look at influencers because the the ones with the hundred thousand followers, you know, oh, they're big cheese until the million uh, follower person comes in and then and all they want is they just want to get climb up, climb up, climb up. No connection to anything, not because they did anything good. And by the way, because actually they're probably doing something bad, because if you've got millions of followers and getting millions of views, you are distracting a lot of people from doing something useful. Huh. If you I think about, about yeah. If you think about how how much you have contributed to so many different uh, passions on a daily basis for millions of people, if you have millions of viewers, it's like talk about selling your soul to the devil. Mm. Like you, you're 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 a, a high priest of Asidia, basically. Wow. Yeah. You know, like, and it's like, oh, that's what you want to be. Yeah. It's I mean, it's that, it's that temptation that Christ faced. You know, in the desert, they just bow down instantly. Like they don't even mm-hmm. hold out for anything. Like the devil's like, I can give you fame. Like done. Where do I bow down? Yeah, like, yeah. Where do I like? Do you need me to get a mat? Like. Do I got to go get a pen? I can run to Office Max real quick. Do I need to sign this? I'd like, what do I need to do? And the devil's like, I'm not even finished. Like, I could give you, okay, yeah, you just want this. This is fine. Okay, yeah, I'll just give you fame. That's like, by the way, 
you're going to end up dying of a drug overdose. That's fine. Well, you get like 15, 20 good years of like living the high life. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's cool with me. That's fine. Because then I get that life I've been promised my entire life. I mean, it, but is but is anybody paying attention to the Paul brothers or Andrew Tate? Like, is anybody stopping and looking and being like, do, are these do these guys really seem happy to you? Because they don't seem happy to me. They seem like mis- they seem miserable to me. And that was um, I knew people from California that were in AA and they had singers of very, very famous bands. And one that stuck out to me really hard was before he entered recovery. He said he remembers sitting on his private island in his beautiful house, just having finished a night of rompous lovemaking. I'm sure with several women, several probably intoxicated the next morning staring at his front door at his own private view into his own little ocean, just being black, miserable, just okay. like could not begin to care less about it. it. would burn it down, would gladly sell it if he could just get a little bit of peace, just a little bit, just gladly get rid of all of it. If he could just get a little bit. And that stuck with me because it's like, man, it, and there's been enough movies about the, tumultuous lives behind the scenes of actors past of actors of years past and stuff like that it's like it doesn't it looks miserable to deal with the devil i mean like i mean i've been listening to a little bit of older music and i've realized like the andrew sisters are in everything like mm. andrew sisters coined a very particular female heim- harmonizing technique from the 40, 30s 40s and 50s i don't i could be wrong but when i think of world war ii music I think of the Andrews sisters. I didn't even realize that for a long time, but I didn't know who they were until like six months ago, but they were at the mm-hmm. top of their game. And maybe I'm frozen. Yeah. Mm. I think I, mm. yeah. Anyway, anyway, the point is it's insane to me because they were huge, but you know, yeah. father's frozen now or he's being stoic. He's yeah. Stoic. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <I'm> <laughs> but yeah, my point was it's fleeting. It's fleeting. I think that's actually probably not the worst way to end the show. Is that right there? Because, uh, yeah, we're coming up on two hours. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. But it's just, it was amazing to me. They were everywhere in the music scene for decades. And I didn't know who they were. And I have no a fair amount about music. Like, but, you know, I suddenly discovered like, oh, these are these women. They're everywhere. So mm-hmm. anyway. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Father? I have I no idea. That. <laughs> 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 the, the Sally lady. What? <laughs> the Andrew <laughs> sisters. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> do you guys know is who it, I'm did talking you about? Just mention the Andrew sisters. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no oh, idea. Oh, for real? <laughs> okay, so this proves my point. So. My internet connection is unstable. Oh, hold on, I'm gonna look them up. Hold on, I'm gonna look them up. They're everywhere. They're, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't they're okay. They're everywhere, but what? I don't. Okay. <laughs> so when you think of when you think of like World War II music with like like harmonized female Andrew vocals, with, like oh wow. Captain okay. America would be listening to him. From like oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. They're everywhere. Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. I mean, okay. this is probably okay. the, the, the song yeah. where I would be like, okay, yeah, I do. I definitely well, know. And if you, don't, if you don't okay. know the name. What's <laughs> that one? That's a weird. They got some weird songs, man. Beat me, daddy. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. yeah, I don't know about this. I don't know about what this. is this. Okay. <laughs> what song is? Moving Yo, they were wild. Right like, beat me, daddy. Beat me, daddy. Eight to the bar. They. That was some. We we <laughs> must be we were, right That along. was. We're mixing. That up. was a weird time. <laughs> okay, so do you know Pistol Pack and Mama? That's a Pistol Pack and Mama. Song. Don't fence me in. That's a yes jingle but bells it, straight even, up and fly right yeah 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 these are huge these are all big even if you don't know these chattanooga choo choo i know i know i know a lot of these but even if you didn't and you listen to them you'd be like i know this style of music this is the music that's playing like meanwhile in the 1940s it's like yeah, and then exactly, stuff like yeah. this would be playing 
they had an enormous impact on the music industry. Yeah. And we're all sitting here and being like, where did, wait, who is these ladies? What did they do? And it's like, okay, no. But at the same time, you go back to the time of like being the peak of their, their industry. Everybody knows who these ladies are, but we're not 80 even, million we, records. 80 years later, 80, 80 million records, they 80 sold. million records. And 80 years later, you ask 10 people, probably three out of 10 knows who they are. Ah, so oh, so you're saying it's fleeting? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, that's oh, okay. That, that was your point. Okay, faulty okay. internet connection aside, that's my general point. And this is mind blowing to me that I just am hearing about these ladies like six months ago, but I've okay. heard all of these songs. Okay, like most of their early songs. Anyway, fleeting internet connection aside, that's all I was really trying to say was how fleeting it was, and we talked about it before with. You're a really great public servant. You'll get a bridge named after you or something like right. that. Right. Congratulations. That's awesome. Good for you. But right. like at the same time, here I am talking about something that St. Maximus the Confessor did, you know, 1500 years ago and being in complete awe. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, you brought now you brought it full circle. I'm glad we went. I'm glad we went on the journey. Okay. Hey, that's going to be, that's going to be okay. a great, hey, kids, stick around to the end of the episode. Because uh, it gets loopy towards the end. Andrew's connection gets gets <laughs> gets a little bit out of whack. So anyway, I'm going to end it. I'm going to make an executive decision because my internet does not seem to be getting better. Um, we did a promotional uh -oh. video. He's gone. Are you there? I'm just going to go keep ahead. Talking. You're good. Okay. Um, no, you're good. Keep talking. Uh, we did a promotional video for Mount Tabor School of Liberal Arts uh, associated with St. Mary of Egypt. Uh, I think it was in the uh, uh, notes last week or last recording. We'll put it again it this week if that's okay, Cyprian. Please check it out. Yeah. Um, if nothing else, use it as a blueprint if this is something that you're wanting to do as well. It's an absolutely fantastic, well done, um, well done presentation. I love it. Not a, not a, uh, Everyone was crying when we showed it at St. Mary's. Not they a dry eye. My wife, not a dry eye, thank you. My wife instantly started crying because it's beautiful. It's lovely. We know these children. It's absolutely incredible. Um, please check it out. Uh, donations are always welcome. Um, then from there, we have a merch store, Royal Path Thought Store. All proceeds go to uh, either the parish or the people who make it. Uh, like two thirds of the parish, one third of the people who make it. Anytime we mention music, goes down pod, uh, on a playlist on Spotify called Royal Path Podcast Playlist, something like that. If you want to reach out to us, please do. It's at um, contact at royalpath.network. That is our official uh, assistance. Uh, uh, she answers that. She's great. Um, people are still re reaching out to me at andrew at royalpath.network please feel free to do that. I just have to say every time it's going to be a little while before you heal back from me. I'm just not, it's not my strong suit. Correspondence is not my strong suit, at least via email. Um, but feel free to reach out. I got back to some people this last week that had emailed me probably like a week before that. So it's all possible. Um, is there anything else that we say? Um, thank you for the thumbnails. Jack, 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 you're killing it uh again amazing thumbnails we're loving it um keep up the good work please and then um if nothing else thank you for having a good night bye-bye bye-bye